So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, today's webinar, as you well know, is about black soldier fly larva and its potential application for sludge treatment. Um, the black soldier fly interest comes as we all have the same problems. We're looking for sustainable sanitation solutions and we need to address the increasing urbanization and amounts of fecal sludge, but also incentivize this at the same time. Um, so the black soldier fly larva process converts organic waste into pre-pupae, that said right, um, black soldier flies, and that's where the um, incentivization can come from because the larvae can then be used for potential stock feed or not even sold, but just uh, it's a more organic way to handle sludge. Um, so we have three particular models that are being uh, talked about today at different levels of scale. So the Durban example, which will now be moved to the end, uh, is at a different level of scale to that of the project in Sweden, which is containerized, and is at a different scale to what uh, Water for the People have been doing in uh, Uganda. So it's nice to have a spread, and I think it's also important to recognize that different projects have different uh, scales that they're intending to reach, and not everybody is looking for citywide domination. So it's important to kind of understand where they're all coming from and the delicate ecosystem that the black soldier fly live under, uh, which is probably the biggest challenge. So on that, I'm going to hand over to Cecilia, and we're going to have um, 15 minutes presentation and then 10 minutes questions to her. Then we'll have another presentation and questions, hopefully another presentation and questions, and then we'll have some group discussion at the end. So, Cecilia, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, good. Um, so I'm going to talk about the black soldier fly research we have been doing in Sweden since 2011, and um, the process to the pilot we're const uh, uh, currently uh, building. So. Um, I have a slide here about uh, who we are and who I am, um, which you can look at later if you're interested. So we are the Environmental Engineering Group uh, at the Swedish uh, University for Agricultural Sciences in Uppsala. And we work with many different types of uh, nutrient recycling. Um, and this is one of the uh, systems we work with. So the concept that we had, which I, I assume that I, I kind of had hoped that I wouldn't be the first presenter so that someone else would have talked about the background. So I'm going to assume that uh, most of you listening know uh, about the black soldier fly and, uh, and the background. And um, yeah, let's start from there. So the concept that we had um, was to, um, through, um, to, to, increase the value of the organic waste and by increasing the value enabling it to uh, um, bear the cost of the of the treatment so uh, and so we could feed that back into the treatment because we believe that's one of the reasons why the the not just the fecal sludge management but the organic waste management doesn't work so well so um that was the background to our, our uh, how we started off, and um, at the beginning we had planned to place these. We, we were into decentralized waste management, and uh, we wanted to place this whole treatment unit um, at the place where the waste is being generated. And we thought that we would place everything there, uh, including the colony, because in, initially we thought, well, we have the treatment. We add a few mini larvae to the waste, and we just need a few flies to to generate the mini larvae. Um, but we quite quickly learned that it wasn't that easy with the colony maintenance of the of these flies. Um, so we changed our concept, and we went into something we call the semi-centralized modular waste management. Um, and in that case, in in this scenario, we have um, a centralized rearing and refining uh, um, facility, um, and then we have the different uh, the treatment modules where only the treatment occurs, um, um, at, uh, different, uh, at the place of um, uh, 
uh, at the place where the waste is being generated. I didn't and uh, someone I is uh, talking. So. Uh, yeah, I actually think that's Nick. <laughs> okay, so hopefully so, so after this, it'll okay, all come yeah. through. <laughs> Um, yeah, but anyway. carry on for now, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. So from, from the treatment, we get the products, um, and we transport these back to the centralized treatment uh, unit and uh, do some refining. So um, if we start with the rearing, which we discovered was a bit more complicated than what we first had thought, um, you have to have the rearing separated from the treatment system to get a more efficient uh, process. So that we can, uh, um, so we can have a continuously input of uh, fly larvae into our treatment. So I need to write um, this, so please. Well, just turn the weave can So the the for the fly rearing, it requires uh, around 25 to 30 degrees um, sunlight or UV light, and ideally around 60 percent relative humidity. Now in Sweden, obviously, this is um, a bit of a problem. And uh, so we need to do it in a greenhouse. And, um, but it also requires skilled personnel, so it's not, um, and some additional infrastructure. Um, and you should circulate around 1 to 2% of the generated larvae back into the colony for the production of the mini larvae that you add to the waste. Um, because of, of this being a bit more, uh, um, requiring a bit more infrastructure than we first thought, we, play, we thought it's not ideal for having it at a farm, for example. It's just a little bit too much work. So we separate it and do it centrally. Um, so if we go into the treatment, um, I'll just talk about what we have found so far in our research. We have done some um, hygiene measurements to see what happens to some pathogens in this process. And we've seen that the salmonella, which is a phonotic bacteria, meaning that it infects both humans and animals, is the uh, inactivated in this process. So if you, if you see the graph, um, the, uh, um, here you see that the, on the y-axis is the concentration of uh, salmonella in the substrate, and in this case it's uh, fresh feces. And on the x-axis you have days. So you see how the larvae, uh, where we have the larvae, um, the concentration goes down fairly quickly. So it's very efficient. We don't know exactly why. In, in activating the uh, salmonella. We have also looked at some other um, um, other microorganisms, and we've seen that viruses are also inactivated in this uh, process. Um, I should mention, though, that we have looked at Ascaris, the parasite, and um, the eggs of the Ascaris worm is not inactivated. So if you want to use the fertilizer for unrestricted use, of crop production, you should have some kind of post-treatment um, of that. But for it's really it should also be stressed that the the zoonotic bacteria salmonella is inactivated, which is actually really good. We've also looked into some um, pharmaceutical residues and pesticides, and this is the an, uh, what we found for carbamazepine, which is a very stable um, compound used for anti epileptic uh, uh, I can't pronounce it. Never mind. It's a carbamazepine, and uh, we see here also that the that the concentration is um, goes down really quickly. So we have a half life of less than two days in the in the BSF treatment, which is really quick because in the soil you can have it for up to to 50 days, a half life of up to 50 days, uh, and in in the water it just isn't broken down at all. So you can actually find this, find this compound in uh, most water streams around the world today. We've checked some other um, substances also, some uh, fungicides, antibiotics, uh, and uh, we've seen the same, we've seen the same, same trend that the half-life is very short in the fiber compost because it's a very active biological system. So it uh, we believe that this uh, creates a good environment for the bacteria, and that it is, in fact, the bacteria that uh, that breaks down these substances in the process. Now, if we go to the actual the modular idea that we have, what what we're thinking is to to have the waste being treated at the place where it's generated, or semi um, 
centralized place. But so we don't have to transport all the waste to a centralized location because in reality we're transporting a lot of water around. Um, and this could be the case maybe for a neighborhood in a municipality, a vegetable market, a restaurant, a pig farm, something around these lines. And it could also be in places where it's not so easy to transport the, the residue that you're getting. Or at a, a, a public toilet, for example, something uh, where it might be difficult to transport the waste. And then the mini larvae, uh, we, we deliver to the, this uh, treatment facility. Um, but this is a small uh, volume, since they are small. But we also transport the, the products back from the, the, this module to the rearing facility to guarantee uh, a good post-processing. With this um, modular idea, it can be scalable. So if you have more waste, you just add another module. And if you have less wa waste, you can remove it. It can also be good for a seasonable variation of waste. Like um, in Sweden, for example, we have peaks of uh, um, lots of apple waste in the autumn. Um, so it could be used to place at that peak and then removed when you don't need it anymore. So this is uh, some of the ideas. Also, you don't have to build yourself into a solution, but it's, you're more flexible in terms of how much waste you can treat and so on. So that's in the process. And this, these numbers, it depends. Um, what substrate you're uh, treating, the efficiency and the biomass, waste to biomass conversion rate and these um, parameters. Uh, but it's around 50 to 80 percent on wet weight basis. And uh, you can, out of the total waste in, you can, uh, you can convert um, 20 to 30 percent into biomass. Um, now, we are moving, we have moved to a batch process. We started with a continuous system because it's very efficient in a waste treatment uh, um, perspective. But we moved into a batch process because we were experiencing some uh, sudden larval deaths that uh, we weren't very good. So we minimized this risk associated with that using batch process. We also have to always keep in mind when designing the system is the, the height of the material. You, uh, a low height um, has to be ensured so that the, the, you don't have uh, anaerobic conditions forming in the material. And it can be, if you have too much material at once, the larvae will not be able to process it. So have to keep it uh, quite uh, uh, small amounts of material. So that always that will make um, usually makes people do this treatment in layers. It's more efficient. So the idea with the modular waste is you have a smaller module that can take about 10 to 15 kilograms of waste. You put it, you stack it to increase the surface um, area treatment capacity. Um, and then you place everything into some kind of container or something that you can move to the place where the waste is being generated. We are looking into doing, having, using a freight container because it's so available. But it doesn't have to be like that. So uh, the, the, the challenge when doing it in this confined environment is to, to find the right amount of ventilation that you need to dry the material so you can separate it out, uh, separate the, the larvae from the residue while not inhibiting the actual fly larvae composting process by forming a crust on the surface or drying out the larvae before they're in the treatment. So this is a bit of a, a challenge, but um, we believe it's doable. So if you see with the pictures here, we have at the middle of the process and at the end of the process that the material has been dried out and it's easy to sieve out the larvae. We are not waiting for the larvae to crawl out themselves. We are separating them out when the larvae are in the fourth or fifth instar, when they're still white, before they turn into pre -pubie. And we, we went to that type of system because it's easier to control and have it the way we want it. Now, if we look at the capacity of this uh, modular system in each container, we, we should this is for organic waste, we should be able to treat 500 kilograms to a ton per day. So we need to add uh, 
0 0.5 to 1 million mini larvae per day, and then every day we'll get 200 kilograms around uh, of compost out and about 200 to 300 kilograms of uh, larvae out. And that amounts to about 130 euros of the worth, which is quite a lot for, uh, um, for this material. Of course, if we treat 500 kilograms, it's uh, not, yeah, exactly. So uh, per, per ton is that value. Um, so if you look at closer to the generated products, we have, um, we know that the larvae are good as a feed um, because they are high in protein and fat. So they are around 40% in protein on dry matter basis. But the interesting part is the amino acid profile. So it's not just that it has profile, but that it has, um, but that it has um, an interesting um, amino acid profile, so it's uh, the, the amino acids that are required by animal, and these are animals, so it's animal uh, protein, and one of the most interesting amino acids is the methionine, uh, it's the, so the, the proteins that contain sulfur, so these are important for poultry and fish, primarily, and if we look here, it's not as high as fish meal, but it's still higher than soy. Uh, which is the most commonly, it's very commonly used in conventional farming in Europe today. So this is interesting if we can produce a good quality animal feed from waste. We've looked into the biomethane potential of the BSF treated residue also, and we've done it for both feces and food waste. And if we look at the, what we came up to, what I'll just let you know that the for the BSF uh, composted food waste, we still have a quite high biomethane potential, uh, so it's comparable to to um, fresh feces. But for the BSF composted feces, the biomethane potential really isn't very high. We did a, a product value comparison to, to estimate how much value we could get out of one ton of waste, and we've done it for food waste and feces. And this is not uh, the total value. It's not. Uh, it doesn't take into account the cost of treatment. It just gives us an estimation of the value, so it can give you an idea of how much um, how much the treatment can cost. And uh, we compare thermophilic composting, which is the most commonly used biological treatment of uh, of organic waste, with fly larvae composting, anaerobic digestion, and fly larvae composting followed by anaero anaero anaerobic digestion. And what I find very interesting is, is that for feces, it is more, um, it, it have, gives a higher value to produce fly larvae, com, com, um, to use fly larvae composting rather than anaerobic digestion. For food waste, it's more or less the same value that you can get. But like I said, this doesn't take the actual cost of treatment into account. So it's just uh, an estimation of the value that you can have. So I uh, find that really interesting, especially in terms of treatment of feces. Um, so I'm um, just very briefly about the current leg uh, legislative st status in Europe. The flies in Europe uh, here are considered production animals, so they are not allowed to be used for feed or to other production animals, and they are not allowed to be reared in any animal byproducts, such so as food waste and manure. But they can be fed to, if uh, alive, to to both. Uh, to all animals except ruminants, so to, to chickens and pigs, the, you can feed them alive. Um, you can also give the insects fat to any all the different species, um, but and to, to pet and fur animals. You are also allowed to give unprocessed former food, as if it's from vegetable origin and dairy and eggs, because these don't contain prions, which is the big it's in stigmat cow disease where this legislation came in place and the, the fear of uh, transmitting prions into the food chain. So it's, uh, here with this picture we see the, um, um, what is allowed and what isn't allowed um, in terms of insects for feed. Um, but that's the current situation. And uh, since of 1st of July 2017, it's allowed to give vegetable bread uh, reared insects to Fish. So that's the newest change in the regulation, and an exception, and maybe, hopefully, more exception will follow. So that's, but this is the current situation in Europe. So um, I just 
These are the people that have supported us with our research so far, and thank you for your attention. Uh, brilliant, thank you. Uh, I find it so interesting, the EU <laughs> legislation around that and how bugs, because I believe you have to have a vet on site for the, for the larva. Is that true? That I, you have to have a, what, sorry? The a vet. Yeah, yeah, you put a slaughtering, because they are considered production animals, so all the, all the rules that uh, occur for other production animals, which are like the, the ca uh, cattle and pigs, uh, they, are, they apply to the insects. Amazing. Um, OK, so we've had a couple of questions, um, some quite technical ones. So I will put those to you. If anyone wants to ask any questions, please type them in the uh, chat box. Or if you've got your mic connected, feel free to put your hand up. We'll take about five, ten minutes of questions, and then we'll move on to maybe Nick's presentation next. Now we've got him back, and we can see him there in lovely warm Durban. Um, so the first question that I had was, uh, if there's a reduction in the unpronounceable carbamazepine, I apologize, mm -hmm. um, where does it go? Does it go into the larva body? Um, no, it doesn't, because we checked the, the accumulation, and there was no accumulation. So it's broken down. It's, okay. uh, it's turned into something else. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, and just. Um, because I haven't got any, do, do, do. Um, is the BSF able to reduce the fatogen in feces? Uh, you mean pathogens or fat I think pathogen? it's pathogens. Uh, yeah, I think that might be a typo. Good okay. Uh, yes, yes. So um, yeah, they are, but not all. But they they in, um, inactivate uh, the, some bacteria and uh, viruses. Um, so and. Principally, the, 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 the salmonella, which is a zoonotic bacteria, so that one can be of high risk, especially in a small farm um, where many animals and us can get sick. Um, so it can, it can really, this treatment can really reduce the risk of disease transmission. But it doesn't inactivate the, the eggs of parasites. So if you, for, for unrestricted use of the crops um, eaten raw, then a post uh, treatment would be required of the residue. OK. Um, I'm going to ask a question, too. My background is much more in business opportunities around sanitation. So for me, the containerized element is actually what excites me most, because I can see potential of this uh, in many different areas. What, and I appreciate that you're still working out the technology and you're still refining it. So I guess for me the question would be, what processes do you think you need to go through in the next however many years before we can have a product that we can that you could look at renting out to someone or someone could buy as a business opportunity? Um, yeah. So we are currently setting up this uh, the first. Uh, pilot uh, for one ton a day in a municipality close uh, to Uppsala um, in uh, Eskilstuna municipality here in Sweden. And it's being tested for food waste. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in, the, in our experience, food waste and feces are quite similar for the black soldier flies. Um, but um, yeah, so this is being uh, done at the moment. Um, and that should, we should have tested it. and. Uh, or by the in, in during the spring here, so in the summer that would be like June, July. We should have a, a better idea of how that system works, um, and uh, yeah, then we have to go because we don't know how what, all the problems that would arise. It's a bit hard to estimate the exact time, but we are in the process of actually testing it on this one ton scale at the moment. So, uh, and um. As a couple of follow-on questions, um, so you've been asked, uh, what's the estimated cost um, yeah. as a number or per ton of waste? And also, is the modular system manually operated? So um, currently, when we're testing it, it's manually operated. But uh, in the long run, for, for running it in Sweden, we will have to automate it. But for other parts of the world, it, it wouldn't have to be automated. So it really depends on where you want to implement it. But in Sweden, we will automize it, uh, because here it's the, the cost of labor is just the highest uh, cost. We don't have any, any estimate of cost for it, because it's just a pilot scale. And any cost estimation would be unrealistically high. So um, 
we don't know the cost uh, estimation at the moment. Uh, that makes and, um, sense. Um, okay. Uh, so I, I just, yeah. I saw a few questions here. I saw someone asking also roughly how high in centimeters yes. that it should be, and we say not so much higher than five centimeters. Um, I don't know how many inches that um, is, but um, and then I saw another question with which was uh, about antibiotic resistance. Yeah. Resistant genes, and we haven't we haven't tested that, so okay. yeah, we don't know. Um, yeah, so um, there's another one about maintaining temperature in the container and how you're managing that. So this also depends on like where you are uh, in the world, because the larvae generate quite a lot of heat themselves, and if you insulate the container, you will be able to. You actually probably have to um, remove. Some of the because you have to remove the moisture that is leaving the substrate. So, and if you have a heat exchanger, then um, you can uh, just the heat that is being generated by the larvae could be enough. But if it goes down to minus 20, like it does here in Sweden, then you might have to heat it a little bit. But if it's around zero, then maybe you don't have to heat it um, be because the larvae is just. But it has to be insulated in that case. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we'll take a couple more. Uh, some of the technical questions, I'll be interested to see if uh, any of the other presenters have different solutions to the actual environment to the black soldier fly larva. Um, so what gases are emitted by the larvae, such as CO2, nitrous oxide? So we've done some preliminary tests on the greenhouse gas emissions, and we it's mostly carbon dioxide, uh, very little methane, and uh, Hardly any nitrous oxide is what we've seen. So it's mostly, and and this also comes with like that we have a quite thin layer of um, material. Okay, um, and then do you know how much a larva, how much a larva is, is able to digest during its lifespan? Can you be as specific as that? Yeah. So um, I should know this by heart, but uh, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, I have to. It, of course, it depends on uh, what. They feed, but if we look for like on um, uh, if we look in in case of uh, for food waste, then they digest around um, um, can I just get back to that? Of course you can. You can type your response during one of the other presentations if you want. Um, I'm going to ask one last question. There are a couple of questions which I think some of the other presenters can equally answer around uh, what happens if the, fly, if the larva escape and can you cultivate them in uh, arid conditions. But I would like to ask Timothy from ACS question, which is if this modular unit was to be scaled up to a household or homestead level, what from your experience do you think would be the biggest obstacle? Um, for just a household. Um, well, I, I assume I mean, it's scaled up generally so that you're moving the unit around. Oh, moving the unit. I think that like the most, um, uh, the most. I mean, the problematic is is the in. So what we've experienced is a little bit to calculate the amount of larvae that you need per waste, depending on the moisture content, and when you have a very when you have a very um, when you have a very varied moisture content, that some days you have very wet and some days you have a, a lot drier, then it becomes a little bit more difficult to, to for in this contain like in in this especially in these containers since it's more closed off. But if you have it more open, it's but it's still a problem because the, the larvae to, to dry it if you want to separate them out and if you want to have a nice residue. So that's one of the challenges to to estimate how much you can treat and you have to you have to change the feeding regime and how you do it. If it's a wetter substrate, you have to feed it more often. If it's drier, you can feed it less often. So these things can can become a bit of a um, uh, can be challenging. And then it's the constant in. You have to always ensure a good colony that you have a good colony, so you have a constant inflow of, of larvae. So if you have problems with your colony, you're going to start having a, uh, accumulate the, the, the waste. So that could be a problem. But if you have that going, then yeah. Okay. 
Um, I've taken a note of the other questions that have been asked, and uh, if they don't get answered through the other presentations, I will ask the presenters to answer them in the Susanna forum, and you can find your answers there. So now yeah. we're going to move on. Uh, thank you, Cecilia. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, so we're going to move on to Nick, hopefully, with technology being well. Um, and uh, Nick's working as part of Kanyasa Projects, uh, based in Durban. And they have been working on black soldier fly larva for quite a while now, and uh, getting it to an interesting level of scale with some very exciting service level agreements. And uh, as you can tell, I'm quite interested in all of this. So uh, Nick, I'll hand it over to you. Quite excited. Great. Thanks, Esther. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Uh, finally. Oh, that's great news. Um, I, I'm really glad Cecilia went first because she, she could handle all the sort of really technical questions because I'm coming from the business angle. Yeah, we've got, if you can see on that first slide, we've got quite a big team which uh, involves the municipality, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, ourselves, um, the University of Quasi Lunatel, and you know, a lot of the technical research around the project we're doing, you know, and I think Chris is, Chris is involved. So, you may be able to ask, answer some of the more technical questions. And of course, the operator biocycle, um, they're the guys on the ground who are really um, doing the kind of work that Cecilia is doing, I guess, but trying to do it at scale. So I just wanted to kind of start by saying that, just in introducing the team and just, um, you know, so I'm looking at particularly at all the different partners and how we put it together and the lessons we've learned so far. Uh, okay, how do I move on to the next slide? I'll just Uh, you should just. Uh, yes. And there should be one that says, yeah, there you go. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so the objectives of our particular project were um, to, to, to develop this black soldier fly plant, but through a, through a, pub, a public private partnership and using a service level agreement. So that was kind of initiated by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who were looking for projects where we could see how well uh, support projects that, you know, work with private and public. So this was the particular project that the municipality wanted to look at. They had a problem with their urine diversion uh, fecal waste. They were burying some of it. They needed to empty these toilets. And so this technology was, you know, looked at. Um, the other reason was that, yeah, there was a, a company in Cape Town, Biocycle, uh, who, who linked to AgriProtein, who've been working on this particular technology for some time. And, and the way we would measure success um, would be that the cost to the municipality of processing or disposal would be reduced because of the sale of valuable products. So that, that's what we were trying to achieve and, and, and how we were going to measure that achievement. Um, trying to figure out how to go down again. Um, can't see that arrow at the bottom. Oh, there we go. Um, I think my internet is a little bit slow here. Um, yeah, so I started talking to some of those issues. Why, why did we choose Black Soldier Fire? Um, very well on site. The municipality is not seeing it as a long-term solution. You know, with densification, there's less and less space to, to bury waste, and there are environmental issues linked to that burying on site. So they're really looking at a at some sort of solution that would be cost effective and more environmentally friendly. Also, disposal of hazardous waste sites is becoming really expensive, and in fact, the the hazardous waste site in our city um, has recently been closed. There was a lot of public. Um, you know, people are getting really upset about various issues around that hazardous waste site. So uh, it's getting even more expensive because they're now going to transport it quite a long way out of, out of the city. I mentioned that there's this Cape Town company that's been involved in the technology for, for some time. And, and the sort of bioconversion rates that they were getting looked like it could be viable. Um, and they've done some research into, into potential markets for products. Okay, so um, how do we go about developing the service level agreement? Um, 
both the municipality and, and the Gates Foundation wanted something that they could really test um, the partnership. So they, the, the idea was not to go at a very small pilot scale. They wanted to go at a bigger scale, and so this 20 ton a day um, operation was selected. You know, by sort of cautious nature, I wanted to go smaller, um, and, and I guess there are pros and cons. If we, you know, in hindsight, it, it probably might have helped to go smaller and test some of the processes out, but I'll, I'll come to that under lessons learned. Um, so the SLA, um, we developed it, we, we did quite a lot of research, we tested various aspects out, we looked at sort of some of the modeling of the processes in Cape Town, we looked at the risks, and and we developed an SLA which looked after the interest of the parties. And the parties were the municipality and the operator. And obviously the municipality's main objective was to reduce costs and the operator was to run a, a viable business operation. And, and obviously there were issues like health and safety that had to be included. Just, gonna, just trying to get onto the next slide. It's a bit of a slow moving process. I can move it along oh. if it helps. Yeah, I haven't quite figured out the best. Okay, great. Maybe you, if you can move it, Esther, that'll help me. Um, I'll just sure. let you know. Okay, so this um, this is the sort of the business model that we incorporated into the service level agreement. Basically, the, the operator, because they've been really working mainly in Cape Town with food waste, and now we were looking at a sanitation solution, they didn't really want to get involved in the capital expenditure or take that risk, and we were fortunate to have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation come in with grant funding, so that kind of helped to de-risk the project. Um, and then essentially the income um, that was agreed on obviously was through sale of products that the operator felt that they could obtain from the Black Salt Supply lobby, and, uh, and secondly, it was agreed that the municipality would pay a gate fee on a, some sort of sliding scale depending on how profitable the, the, the business was. So that's kind of how we set it up. And we, we said, right, that the plant would, the income and costs would be ring-fenced, and assuming the project made a, a profit after costs, which are listed there, we would then share those profits. So that was kind of how this SLA was, was set up. Um, you can move it along to the next one. Um, this is... Um, just looking at the actual plant and how it kind of was set up um, based on the requirements of the operator. So we have an offload area, and I'll, I'll show some photographs in a sec, um, a waybridge, because basically we, we needed to know how much waste was coming in, because essentially we've got, a, we've got another uh, contractor that empties the urine diversion toilets, brings the waste in, and they paid per ton that, that, that they bring in, and also for the gate fee, the operator would need to be paid for the amount of waste that he processed. So we have an offload area. Um, that waste would then be brought into the mixer. Now, the first problem we've got is the fact that there's a lot of trash or rubbish or detritus, as it's called there, which people are putting into their toilets. So they, they're essentially using their pit to toilets as a, as a solid waste disposal um, point. And that is something that I know Chris and his team from UKZN are, are going to hopefully look at, at really to understand that whole solid waste issue because it's, it's, it's hugely problematic for us uh, in the whole sort of black salt supply process is dealing with that detritus. Um, so also at, that, at the mixer point, we bring in primary sludge, or the operator does, from, we, you know, we're based at a wastewater treatment work, so we've got primary sludge that we could bring in, and it also increases the moisture content to about, you know, they aim at about 70%. And when it comes in, the, the, the UD waste is quite dry. Um, we also remove detritus at the various points. We then have got quite a homogeneous substrate, um, which is then taken to the uh, grout zone. We use a bobcat, small machine, to do that. Um, and it, it's laid out. We, we thought about doing it in sort of vertically in trays, but we've decided on, a, at this stage, a simple simple process where we lay it out in 50 to 100 millimeter layers. Now, I know Cecilia talked about that depth, and that's really important, and at times, in, in you know, we've, we've reduced that, lay, that depth from 100 down to 50 to improve the, the processing, because the larvae really battle 
at those lower depths. Um, and then we've got a, a nursery um, that we've set up on the site. We're thinking of looking at improving that, where we maintain the temperatures uh, to sort of 28 to 32 degrees Celsius, and we feed the, the sort of baby larvae, the three to four day old larvae, with really good quality food waste. Um, those babies are sent from Cape Town because they've got a sort of a breeding site there, and at this stage, we haven't set up uh, a breeding site in Durban, although that is planned. Um, and then when, once they're eight days old, the larvae are taken into the grass zone and spread on that new substrate that's there, and they spend 12 to 14 days there. It's quite a bit of evaporation. Um, and then the adult larvae and, and residue are collected using, again, a machine and taken to the processing unit um, where um, the idea behind the processing unit is separation of, of the larvae and the uh, residue and then processing into the various products. We can move on to the next slide. Just a quick few photographs. So the Weybridge there, uh, that orange and gray machine is our mixer and you can see a skip nearby. So um, that's a whole sort of loading area which we're busy re-looking at how it's configured at the moment and I'll speak about that in a sec. That, that long uh, black uh, agri-tunnel is, is the nursery. It's, it's now on a smaller, a smaller size. We don't need such a big size at the moment, as well as the fact that it was damaged in a storm with 100 kilo kilometer winds at the end of last year. So we're looking at rebuilding a more sort of sturdy uh, nursery. Um, but that, temp as I said, temperature controlled and the food is controlled there. And sort of insects and various other things are controlled and access. The picture on the bottom, two pictures on the bottom right are the actual grass sheds where we lay out the, the substrate and the, the, the young larvae are put on there. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. This is just uh, showing the actual processing uh, equipment that we've got in there. Um, so basically, if you look at bottom left, you'll see the residue and the larvae, that's the adult larvae, come in um, into a screen. Again, we're trying to take out detritus or, or trash at that point. It goes into a bucket elevator, into a, an agitation bin, which is filled with water. And essentially, that's got jets that keep the residue and larvae in suspension, but cleans, cleans the larvae, and they go off into screens. And that's essentially, just after the agitation bin, they get screened, and the residue goes in the, the top uh, row and the, the larvae go in the bottom row. Um, so, so basically the residue gets dried out and eventually into a rotary kiln and made into biochar and the larvae is also dried and then pressed and made into meal and oil. Um, having said that, we're re looking at the entire process now because we've got a few challenges which I'll, I'll mention in a sec. We can move on to the next slide. Okay, these are just a few photographs of the, that processing equipment. So um, that starting from top left, the bucket elevator, so the, the bobcat drops the, the adult larvae and residue into that um, start of that elevator that takes it up into the agitation bin, which is essentially a, a, a large swimming pool with jets. Um, and, um, and then it comes over the edge of that uh, agitation bin into the the sort of screening area, and that's the third photograph on the, on the top row, where the larvae are coll collected on the first screen and the residue drops into the second screen. We have, we've had a number of challenges with the agitation bin where the residue, a lot of it is settling and is not staying in suspension, as well as going through both screens, so getting into the bottom stump. Um, the photograph on the bottom left is the oven dryer for the larvae that uh, then get dried, and then on that sort of pipe that's coming towards you on the left is a screw conveyor going into this press in the bottom middle, uh, which would press the larvae for oil. And on the bottom right, you've got the kiln or biochar retort for the residue. If you look at all of those, the biochar retort has worked quite well, and we've produced some great um, biochar. However, we've had problems with expansion because it consists of two sleeves and we're having to rework that biochar retort. And fortunately, the municipality have got involved in that, and they're reworking that 
by Charit Tort to get it working more effectively. The oil press is also, uh, they, the, the operator is looking at that as well because it's not working effectively. So um, aspects of the processing are working well, but there's a number of aspects that, are, that we're needing to re-engineer. Move on to the next slide. Yeah, so I've mentioned some of these challenges. So on the service level agreement, um, the parties were obviously quite concerned on risks, and we, it took six months to a year to get that service level agreement agreed upon and signed by both parties, and obviously that affected the approval process. And then, you know, we were hoping to get to business viability by now in terms of that's how that service level agreement was set up, and we haven't got there, mainly because of technology challenges. So I mentioned the detritus or the trash, that the volume that's coming in is quite high. Um, separating that detritus out, we're looking at new ways of doing that. Um, the wet separation of the larvae and the residue, which takes place in that agitation bin, um, we've had problems with settlement of the residue. Um, part of that is due to the high sand content. People put sand into their toilets as a form of cover, so that's been challenging. Um, but also the operator is starting to think that they may go back to dry separation uh, because it just defeats the object to, to, to use wet separation because you've now you've got quite a dry substance the lot, you know, when it comes out of the grout sheds and then you're wetting it and now you're going to dry it again. So it's kind of defeating the object from an energy point of view. So they're re-looking at that. As I mentioned, the oil press wasn't working effectively and they're re-looking at that. The biochar retort is being restructured just to handle the expansion, okay, the two sleeves. The other issue we found is that when we did our initial assumptions on the business modeling from the Cape Town operations, we were assuming about a 15% bioconversion rate. So essentially for every 100 kilograms of uh, waste coming in, we were assuming we would get 15 kilograms of larvae. And, uh, we're only getting about 10% in the initial mass balances that Chris and his team with Ellen have found so far. We, you know, we've been, for I think from August through to October, we were running at about three tons a day and um, with a few challenges, but essentially, you know, that, that's the kind of bioconversion conversion we were getting. We were down to 10%. So obviously that would affect the business modeling that we did. A part of that is due to the, as I mentioned, the high solid waste content. Part of it is due to the high sand content. Um, we're also getting higher moisture content of the residue after the bioconversion. So Chris and his team are, you know, are looking closely at, at that, and he, he, you know, he could answer some further questions on on that sort of mass balance issues. Okay, let's see. You can move on to the next slide. Um, yeah. So just some of the successes we've had. Um, the breeding side. Okay, that is happening in Cape Town, but that's been really great. Uh, that's, you know, they're really producing very high quantities of eggs. And that process is going well. Also, the transfer of those DNA from Cape Town to Durban um, is going really well, and the nursery operations have been really effective. Um, the mixing of the UD waste and the primary sludge to get a homogeneous substrate, that's gone pretty well. Um, and then the processing of the substrate by the larvae has gone reasonably well. The, some of the challenges have been in winter where our ambient temperature has been at about 18 degrees in the processing shed. So that's you know, reduced the bioconversion you know, rates to quite an extent because you know, they prefer 25 to 30 degrees. So in winter, even in Durban, we're getting quite cool temperatures which are affecting, um, you know, making it quite seasonal in, in terms of our uh, processing effectiveness. Um, and then we've, we've had reasonably reliable supply of UD waste, primary sludge because we added treatment works, and food waste where they've needed that, particularly at the nursery. So that's been great. Um, we can move on. So some of the lessons learned, you know, we've got to last significant time. I mean, essentially we're looking at this as a partnership between the municipality and, and, a, and, a, and an operator with different needs, and we've got to allow significant time for developing that SLA check to the parties, especially when we're trying out new technologies. Um, so in hindsight, we, we think we probably needed to do full feasibility at a, at a smaller scale 
um, to really to test out because we've learned so much along the way. But at the same time, one could say, look, if we didn't try and do it at scale, maybe we wouldn't have learned the same lesson. Um, and then we, you know, we really what we're doing now is we're in a sort of an iterative development stage where we we're changing various aspects of the project to improve, you know, how we're operating. So you've got to allow for that in this kind of, you know, when you're trying out this kind of technology. Okay, we can move on. Just, just I'm almost done now, but on the way forward, um, as, okay, just on the way forward, um, yeah, so the, the great news is that the operator is investing in the plant now. So, so that, that's great. You know, we've, we've started this process and the operator really believes in it and they're starting to invest at quite a big scale and they've got backers to do that. So I think that, that's the really good thing that's happened. The upper, you can still hear, hear me all right? Okay. The, um, the also the uh, uh, the operator is starting to is saying, look, we're going to look at a more simpler product for now. We're going to look at uh, more of a fertilizer product, which will be easier to get into the market, uh, which will be a residue and dried larvae mix as a starting point, just because of some of those challenges with with getting feed into the market. Um, we've got a new a press at the front end to try and remove the detritus. We're working on that. We're doing repairs and amendments to the kiln, the biochar retort. We're going to be bypassing the wet separation, and there's going to be a lot of further testing with UKZN and partners. We've got new laboratories coming to site, um, and we, we should be getting saleable products during this year. Also, the operator is really confident, and they want to start planning a much bigger plant. Um, I mean, the municipality is saying, hang on, You've got to get it working really effectively first at this scale before we'll support a, a larger plant. Um, so that's something we, we're kind of uh, discussing. Um, and the last slide, which I still can't see, is just that um, the Tritus Press, which has just arrived on site, which will be linked up to the mixer. Um, so we hopefully we're going to get some solutions to our issue of trash in the waste. So that's about it. Thanks a lot. Um, that was really interesting. Um, I know that this has been in discussion in South Africa since about 2012 or 13, so it's taken quite a long time to get to this stage of production. Um, so yeah, and I also think it's really interesting to look at it from a business model point of view because it's all very well developing these technologies if we don't look at how it fits into the systems that we're looking at applying it. So um, yeah, that was really interesting. Okay, so. Currently, we haven't got so many questions coming in yet, but please feel free to type them or put your hands up and you can ask a question yourself directly if you've got your microphone. But Natalie has asked, um, since the urine diversion waste is so dry, would it be more feasible to go straight to biochar and skip the BSF? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, these are questions the operator could ask, but, you know, I think they're, they're wanting to get the, they're still wanting to get the oil, which is quite high value, out of the larvae. Um, and then, you know, and then at this stage mix a, you know, make a sort of fertilizer mix with that dried larvae and residue. So I think that's where they're seeing the value and the ease of getting into the market. Um, so they, yes, they are going to be using that biochar retort um, for, for residue, but I'm not sure, it tends, possibly it may take away some of that value if they you know, just convert it straight into biochar and you may lose some of that nutrient value. Okay. Oh, I really like this question. Um, so what advantage do the, does this process have over more conventional ones for processing wastewater treatment um, primary sludge? Um, could it be relevant in European contexts as well? Yeah, you know, the... Uh, the operator did some tests early on where they used mainly primary sludge from the treatment works. We had quite a small treatment works in Durban and they really got great results. So that is something the municipality in Durban is looking at because they're sitting on tons and tons of uh, sludge from standard conventional treatment works and they, it's certainly something we're going to be looking at. Look, our primary focus has been on UD waste because that was a particular problem and that was also um, be put forward gates, but it's certainly um, the city of Durban is going to be looking at it as a solution um, because really they, you know, cost of suddenly transporting wet sludge or you know, getting wet sludge out to agricultural farms. Um, our city, I think, you know, 
they're, they're sitting on massive stockpiles, so they really are looking for solutions. I, I, you know, I certainly think it's going to have uh, some, you know, benefits to, to, to your conventional treatment works. Also, I think what our, um, what the operator here that we're working with, Bicycle, they are looking at combining food waste with primary sludge. So that, you know, just really looking at the best ways of using your nutrient streams in a city. So that's one of the reasons I think they want to go to a bigger scale, um, is so that they can look at combining various streams of waste. Okay. Um, there are a lot of questions coming through, but I'm going to cherry pick the ones that are aimed a bit more about um, business level, because I know that you're not a, a, a biochemist or a specialist in uh, lava. But what are you... Um, <laughs> what's the larval protein being used for at the end of your process at the moment? Okay, so, you know, they they haven't actually sold product as yet. Um, you know, they've got some product out, but because the, you know, the original plan was to press the larvae, so the oil would then go to industry, that would come out of that pressing process, and the, 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 the the balance of the, the larvae would be used in a feed mix. But what I said in the presentation is that because they're concerned about uh, just the market penetration and some of the issues around getting that into market, they, their plan for this year, 2018, is to rather look at they're still pressing larvae for oil, but um, using the protein, balance the protein, and make it into a fertilizer, so more for agriculture and it would be easier to penetrate the market. So that's their short-term goal for 2018. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. I'm going to leave it there because we've still got Steve's presentation. I'm just wondering if some of these questions, though Osbert's asked a question about inbreeding in black soldier fly larva. So that may also come up in Steve's presentation. Um, but uh, thank you for that. And as I've said before, I'll take note of all these questions and any that don't get answered as we're doing the webinar, we will put to the presenters and get the answers onto the forum for you. So you will still get an answer to your question. So uh, thank you, Nick. That was really interesting. Um, Steve, are you ready to enlighten us uh, with what Water for the People have been doing? Uh, even Water for People, uh, yes. Even Water for, sorry. <laughs> yes, uh, so this is uh, the, the, the low tech uh, low capital cost approach uh, to black soldier fly and very much a process of learning by doing. Uh, I should be presenting this with Osbert, my colleague, but unfortunately his uh, internet connection isn't very good enough. He, he's based in Uganda. So I'll be taking you through it all. So we actually, I became first interested in, in black soldier fly in about 2013 when I was working for London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. And that was a, a, a study that was done by Ian Banks, which basically said that, yes, you can feed black soldier fly larvae on human shit, and the more shit that you actually feed them, the bigger they grow. This, uh, and, and that they were effective in converting human feces into a valuable biomass. So the theory looked very good. We also found out that black soldier fly are basically everywhere in Africa, uh, between those uh, uh, 49 north and 42 south, and the theory was very simple. Uh, you get adult males, they congregate, they uh, go through a, a mating display, they lay clutches of eggs, six to, 600 to 900 eggs a time, uh, they hatch, and then the, the little larva crawl into the food source and, and put on lots of weight. What could be simpler, we thought, nice, simple process like this. Uh, looked at the map, that's roughly where black soldier fly are found between those two two lines. Uganda being smack in the middle of all that should be a perfect place. Uh, then really it was two or three years of things going wrong, which was an interesting learned experience and it was all probably the most hardest bit which I think people find is actually setting up the colony. So the first problem I had was uh, try, trying to enthuse the Uganda team and said, well, we can't find anybody, can't find any black soldier fly. And they said, yes, they, you know, they're there, they're in Uganda, but what do they look like? So I sent across photographs and they had a real problem in actually uh, identifying and finding them in the first place. 
So in the end, I ended up buying some in the UK. Uh, they sell it as lizard food here. And I put it in my hand luggage and flew off to Uganda. Uh, not before some of them escaped over my uh, wife's kitchen and caused a bit of a problem there. But eventually, we got them to Uganda. Um, and that led to lesson number two, what was going wrong. Uh, we'd built cages. Uh, all the larvae pupated. But when I rang up about two weeks later to find how the children were going on, they said ah, that they're, they're all dead. So that actually meant flying out again on another trip with some more black soldier fly larvae. And what we looked in retrospect, uh, what are, they weren't actually dead. What we find now is that just before they pupate, the actually shells go very translucent. And very and and very dried out. And the person who was looking after it at the time assumed that they were dead and just abandoned it without actually waiting a little bit longer for them to emerge. So it was actually quite confusing. And then I took some more out, and this time they waited long enough, and the flies did emerge. And when I rang up later, they said mm, they all died. There's no eggs. So then I had to fly even more out. So by this time, I was getting quite a specialist in, in packing black soldier fly larva and taking them off to, off to Uganda. The problem there was that we had the breeding cages too small. So we built bigger ones uh, with 1.2 by 1.2 by 1.5 meters. We'd also found that we had to raise them off the ground, uh, and we had to dip the legs into trays of oil to stop the black ants. Uh, entry into the cages, the black ants would actually t take away the eggs and, and, and destroy the whole process. We also found that you needed good humidity and good natural light. Uganda is unfortunately blessed with, with these, and it operates at, at more or less the right temperatures throughout the year. So it is a very good place to grow these things. We did experiment with artificial light, but we didn't really have any success with that. Um, to make it, uh, in the cages, we also add some uh, natural or some artificial f flowers to try and simulate the, the uh, natural environment in, in which they, they live and to uh, reduce stress of, of the actual flies. Uh, somebody suggested we played Marvin Gaye music as well, but I don't think that had much impact, really. And that is one of the, the, the sheds there, uh, the breed notes. You can see lots of light coming in, lots of light through the roof, and you can see the plant. Uh, the, the the males tend to hang around on the leaves, whilst the females tend to hang around on the floor waiting for the males. Uh, a bit like a disco, I think. And what went right? This was a, a stroke of luck, if anything. Um, we'd, <laughs> the people that I was tr were, were trying to encourage and get into Black Soldier Fly in Uganda, they were, they were engineers. Um, they weren't particularly interested in Black Soldier Fly. Um, they were doing it as part of their, their, their normal job. And it, it wasn't until Osbert came along, who um, is, a, is an engineer, but actually he started observing and thinking and trying to understand the black soldier fly larvae and how they worked. And he's a real good problem solver. And he actually loved and cared for and took time to understand their breeding habits and realized that he was into farming and not into engineering machine. And I think what really changed in, in uh, our success in Uganda was, was the fact that Osbert took over charge and he really started to care for it. Uh, he cared for them so much that the rest of the staff used to call uh, the, the, the larva his children. And what he found was that the, uh, the adults actually lived longer than, than was, was originally thought. It, they only thought they lived for 48 hours. They actually found that they lived for 5 to 12 days, uh, particularly if you can, you can give them wa some, some water. The, as the optimum uh, conditions for growing the, the larva, he found to be 20 to 30 degrees C. Um, and the eggs would remain there for about four days before they hatched, and then they crawled into the organic waste. Um, the larvae normally take three to four weeks to mature, uh, depending on the conditions. In unfavorable conditions, they will actually take a lot longer. They won't die, but they'll just take a lot longer to reach, matu to reach maturity. And then when they pupate, they take one to two weeks to actually emerge as flies. And the picture on the bottom left-hand corner is 
a, a, a biopod that is very much under stress. So as the other two presenters mentioned, it, it's all to do with the thickness in the of the layer uh, the, the, and the build-up of the temperature and the, the aerobic conditions in which, they, in which they live. When your pod uh, goes into those conditions, the, the lava becomes stressed, the temperature is too high, and their, their natural reaction is to, is to leave. And that's when you'll go in the morning, you'll find them all over the place. So your biopods design is important, and it shouldn't look like the one that you can see there. The, the difficult part, as I said, I think, is actually establishing the, the, the breeding process. Um, it follows the, the normal process for all the, all the inks and from mating to laying the egg production, the larva. Uh, one thing that we, we did was, um, because it was a, a, a low tech type of solution, we actually found that manually picking out the pupa and storing those pupa and putting those back into life cycle was the most uh, effective way of doing it when you're trying to actually establish a colony. When you are, go past this, obviously, into production, you can't afford to do it like that. And some of the larvae go off into, um, go off into to, to the, 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 uh, the food supply, and then the rest go back to the, to the, uh, into the life cycle. Uh, you know that you've got a successful breeding cage is when you see the two flies backing up to each other, like in the top left-hand picture. They'll stay in that position for quite a while, normally on the cage wall, showing that the mating is actually occurring. So if you've got that occurring in your cage, you've, you've, uh, you've achieved uh, the right conditions. Uh, we've also experimented with these self-harvesting uh, designs, which are for the smaller producer and the lower, uh, lower level type of technology. The the, uh, the the whole thing is hinged. It's, it's covered. It's normally in the dark. You can see there. There's melons, uh, normally jackfruit, which is the the source of uh, food for the larvae. But then the holes in the back of the the actual uh, pod or, or or the box. That's where adults adult black soldier fly will come and and mate. So we find that once you've established a colony. Other black soldier flies will automatically find the colony and automatically mate without going through the process of, of having breeding cages. The, the yellow buckets on the, the, the right hand picture is, is to, to capture the larva when they crawl out of their food. So this is probably more the design that would set, which would be suitable for a small farmer looking at, uh, wanting just to keep a few poultry. So then we get to a position after after probably three or four years of, I wouldn't say high grade uh, research, but slowly, slowly plugging away with very little money, and we got into a position uh, last year where we've we've established that yes, black soldier fly will eat fresh shit, but it's it's not actually their favourite food, and. Uh, Getting the, the quantities of fresh shit we actually need to keep the colony going is pretty impossible in Kampala because there's very few urine diverting toilets. We also find that they, they like uh, old pit waste less than they like fresh shit. So it's like giving somebody a choice of, uh, I don't know, pounded yam or matoki. Everybody would obviously go for the matoki straight away and, and forget the pounded yam. The flies make that, or the larvae make that same sort of decision. We also had the question, and, and Cecilia, was, it was very interesting about the, 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 the pathogen transmission. And that was news to me. Um, but yes, we were cautious about pathogen uh, transmission. Certainly, if you're feeding them on fresh shit, you, it, it is a highly pathogenic environment, and you're pulling them out of, out of there where there must be contact. With with a, with a food source, so you've got a higher risk of, of transmission there, and it's possibly a risk that we we didn't have to take. We did get a positive reaction from the poultry farmers, who who uh, which I'll go on to later have always expressed an interest in 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 larva. Um, but what we're also concerned about was the public perception, not just 
whether technically it could, whether there was any risk of disease transmission, but how would people feel about eating a chicken that uh, was being fed on a black soldier fly larva that had been eating shit? And that level of disgust, although it's three levels away, may still have been sufficient to put to put people off. So it was also another area that we, we thought was was the negative side of the black soldier fly larva. And then finally, we, we were working as well with um, a, a few briquettes. And we we're finding successful methods of converting few briquettes in uh, 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 sludge from treatment plants into uh, fuel briquettes. And that was proving to be the more successful t technology for for the uh, for the sewage sludge. So basically, we found an alternative solution. So what if people officially then said, okay, we've interesting experiment. Let's document it. Let's let's let's, let's move on. And so officially, we then what if people have abandoned black soldier fly within within Kampala, but. Uh, Osbert and myself loved them, and it was too good an opportunity to actually waste. So we started looking at the market. Um, in Uganda, the, the the poultry industry, the main source of protein is fish meal, and that the price is is, is escalating. It's currently about 84 cents a kg. They pull the fish out of Lake Victoria and Lake Albert, uh, both of which are becoming overfished, and the government is actively seeking to protect those fisheries, so the source of protein will be reducing. The farmers were also complaining that the, the suppliers were adulterating the, the, uh, the fish food, and they found the quality was actually dropping as well. And also, fish is not a, a natural source of, of food uh, for, for poultry. So insects, when we, if you ever get a chance to feed uh, black soldier fly larva to chickens, they, they go mad over it and will continue scratching the surface where you fed them for long after all the, the last ones have gone. So it is a natural food, but, but that was actually backed up. Uh, unfortunately, it's not been published yet, and, and some of it actually does contradict what Cecilia was saying. There was a, a, a program, a research program called INS, INSFEED uh, for, uh, in Uganda and, and Kenya. And what they found was that the uh, egg quality and the yolk color were very much improved by feeding on black uh, soldier fly larva. So that would be a real advantage to the farmers. They, didn't, they also tested other types of larva. And you can see that's the, for the protein content. And you can see that's the, the, the one in blue is the black soldier fly larva. And that is above what they actually found for the fish meal or for the, for the cottonseed or sunflower meal. The top one there is actually a, an African moth, which they claim to have a 73% a uh, protein content. And then the amount, uh, they, they did work on, on the egg color, the amount of black soldier fi that fed to the, to, the, to the layers improved the quality of the, of the yolk uh, color. So I don't think we have any real problem in convincing poultry farms that this is a good, it's a good food. So what we've set up now is a, is a, a very small company called Nature's Answer. Um, and Nature's Answer, uh, according to Insfeed, uh, if they could just replace 5% of the fish meal that was fed to the poultry within Kenya alone, that would require 32,000 tons of um, dried insects, which that's the big enough, that's market's big enough for me. That's OK. Uh, a lot of the cost as well from the poultry farmers, 60 to 70 percent was on the, the, the buying of the, of, the, of the food. And then, yes, conversion rates we're looking at, we're assuming 30 percent, but we won't know that properly until we, we get a bit further down the line. And the, 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 the fish-based food we're trying to compete with is $1,500 uh, $1, a ton. So the aim of the company is eventually to produce 200 kilograms a day. But up to um, this June, we want to be aiming at 20 kilograms a, a, a day just to test the market, just to get the product out there, to see if we've got any problems with the supply chain. That will, accru that will in itself, we, we estimate to need about two and a half tons of market waste to actually feed that. So we're, we have to work out the supply chain of the uh, of, of the market waste. 
who knows, one day we may get back into um, fecal sludge management. There may be, I wouldn't like to say never again. Um, but at the moment, we're concentrating on the market waste and something that is more acceptable to the, to the customers. These are just some pictures to end with of the cages that, uh, that the Dosbits built. Uh, the one in the uh, quite a traditional way compared to the other two, we still get the eggs laid within um, uh, corrugated cardboard above above the food supply, and the one at the bottom will be will be concentrating on self harvesting uh, of the or, or, or self replication to see if we can actually get that working. Um, and these last pictures, uh, black soldier fly love jackfruit. It's their it's definitely their favourite food. Um, and a couple, there's some pupa at the top that we're going to be returning to the cages. And then one of the problems that we are, that we want to be careful about is rodents that, that will be after eating the pupa. So we're having to screen the, um, screen the tanks in the farm. A very much um, low cost, um, sort of appropriate technology type of approach to black soldier farming, uh, uh, black soldier fly larva farming, which I think, uh, if it if it works, is uh, low capital cost and should be able to be scaled and repeated in other parts of Uganda and other parts of Africa. And that's it. Thank you. If you have any questions, uh, Osbert is is uh, on the he's he's on the line, but he has his connection is not good enough. Uh, but I'm sure that he, him and myself will be able to answer any queries that you've got. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um... I've enabled Osbert's microphone, so if he wants to respond, he can. Um, that was ooh, that was really, really interesting, and I think it's kind of good to have the comparison of the different models uh, from large scale down to home scale, and I guess also from a Oxfam point of view, we kind of like these ones that we can establish, like we've done with the tiger worms in refugee camps, so this kind of maybe not for fecal sludge, but for treating of solid waste might be an interesting, uh, for market waste might be an interesting approach that we could do on a small scale. I wonder if you could even flat pack the cages so that we could have something stockpiled and ready to go. I don't know, interesting idea. Um, so Arno has asked you a question about whether the technology and methods can be broadcasted through agro-extension to poultry farms uh, for self-replication. Uh, good question, Arno. I don't know where the market will be in the future. We'll we'll have to see what interest interest lie it lies there. Certainly, the poultry farmers would have existing would have access to capital, which may be off-putting for a, a real small scale scale entrepreneur in, in in setting up. Even even with our setup, it still takes a few thousand dollars to get it set up. Mm, quite high. Um, and also, there's a question from Emmanuel about whether you've had any problems with using market waste, such as plastic contaminants, and if so, how have you got around that? Uh, no, is the answer. <laughs> is that because you've been creating the the food sources for the? Uh, that yeah, that's because we won't take any of that stuff away. <laughs> there you go. Um, one way of dealing with it. Um, Okay, uh, it seems you've actually got the least questions. Well done. I know that's how you like it. <laughs> um, so we've still got a few minutes for some discussion, and our presenters are all still online. Um, so I don't know if anybody would like to ask another question back to any of the presenters, or if the presenters would like to ask each other a question, which is also uh, very possible. Uh, so yes. Uh, is there anybody out there with any more questions? You can put your hands up. Uh, if you want to put your hands up, it's next to the um, webcam setting on the top where you turned your microphone and your webcam and your speaker on. There's also a person holding their hand up, and that is how you raise your hand. Steve, you've managed to put your hand up. What would you like to say? Yeah, I'd like to ask Celia. I'm, I'm interested in the pathogen survival. So what I don't understand is if you've got lava uh, growing and being bred on uh, fresh shit, how can you get a? Uh, so it's actually in contact with their with their skin. Um, how how can you get such a, a die off as as that? Um, yeah. what, what do you mean in contact with the skin? Well, you've 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 pulled. Oh, okay, if 
when the shit goes through their ingestion processes, presumably you're going to get you get your salmonella die off in that process. But if they're being if their food stock is fresh shit, they're living amongst the shit. So when you pull them out, they may not be excreting any salmonella, but it, the salmonella will still be on their will be on the skin which they've picked up from yeah, the okay. from the environment. Yeah. I'm getting it. so um well we're doing we work with batch processes so we get like all it's not a continuous process but even if you have a continuous process we have a hydraulic retention time that in, ensures that the minimal time in the treatment is sufficient to get the pathogen reduction but like I said we work with uh, with the batch system so then we have at least uh, um, two weeks in the treatment um, and uh, then everything is uh, died off because the, the, the larvae themselves don't have salmonella so it's uh, inact inactivated uh, when it goes through their uh, bodies or through some enzymes that they are uh, excreting um, and once it's gone it's gone because they're not like regenerating any new ones and it's just coming from from the actual feed substrate you understand what Thanks. I mean? Yes I do thank you yeah. Yeah. okay great um, Nick you've also got your hand up what would you like to ask? Um, yeah the two things one um, is you know, I'm quite interested in the whole thing of scale, whether to go, it's something we kind of struggled with here in Durban, whether to go big and build a big plant or whether to go sort of smaller ones more on the way, you know, Steve's looked at it. And it, you know, I think we would like to do that and, and, and have smaller plants situated further out into communities closer to the waste and reduce transport issues. Um, but at the same time, we've got regulation issues and trying to, you know, keep, keep in, to health and safety issues and a whole lot of regulation. So those are the two things that are sort of competing for us. We want to go more decentralized, but at the same time, we've got to now comply with a whole lot of health and safety regulation. So that's kind of the, the challenges that we have. And um, I also just wanted to say the other thing I wanted to say was just on the um, dealing with the pathogens on the skin. You know, our process, we've got a, a drying oven. I forget the temperature of that drying oven, which supposedly kills off those pathogens as they slowly move through it. Um, so, yeah, that's how our operator is dealing with that. Um, that's really interesting. And a, a really good point about the health and safety because um, it was quite clear with Cecilia that there were some restrictions uh, through doing this in Europe. Um, and maybe that's something for future consideration. Um, and building on that, actually, Timothy has asked whether through your work, you've come up with any research questions or possible areas that it would be useful for you to see some research being done to help develop this technology. Uh, so yeah, if any of you have any ideas on that, I think that would be really interesting to hear as well. Okay, I have uh, some, some things that we would like to look into. So uh, the reason why it's not allowed in Europe is mainly because of the prions. That's the, the biggest yeah. challenge. It's not the, the parasites themselves, or sorry, the pathogens. Um, and uh, we don't know what happens with the prions in this system. So that would be one of our research questions that we would be very interested in uh, looking into. Uh, the other thing is, the, um, uh, someone mentioned it also, the um, antibiotic resistant genes that we also don't know uh, at the moment. So that's also something we would like to look into. Um, Osbert's raised about inbreeding again. Um, so I'm guessing there's been some trouble uh, with your project in Uganda with inbreeding uh, and whether or not that impacts on your colony. Would you say, Steve? You need to unmute. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you want to make Osbert. <laughs> um, no, I don't, no I, I, that's the first I've heard of it. I, I don't okay. know. I, I can imagine. I can see. I can see the logic behind it, but I just don't know whether there's whether there's, there's such a split between the between the family relations that, that you know there's just so many black soldier fly. I'm just wondering whether it is a it is a problem or not. Um, what about you, Nick? Are there, what would be the research questions from your side? Uh, yeah, I mean the the things we're going to look into continue you know, researching is the sort of mass balance, looking at what's coming in, what's going out, um, how sand issues are affecting our, our 
material. Also, just the whole social side of things, you know, what people are doing because, you know, we're taking waste from people's homes and, you know, what they're putting into those toilets is having a massive effect on us. So we really need to understand why people are doing things and, and what the municipality can do better to, um, just to change that so that we get a, a better product we can process. Okay. Um, yeah, I think someone like Chris could, there's a whole lot of other technology issues that they are looking at um, in terms of the processing, which I'm not, you know, I'm not able to really give a lot of detail on. Maybe that's a topic for another webinar. <laughs> okay. Um, we are running out of time a little bit, so um, we'll take a couple more questions. Um, I've taken note of some of the suggestions around things to do research that are being typed in. Um, John Harrison has asked Cecilia specifically. Um, I, is that yeah, I, I read the question. Uh, okay, so great. it's about the prions and if uh, they are heat inactivated, and yes, they are, but it's at very high temperatures. So it's above 120 degrees, I think, and if you, you're kind of destroying all the proteins. Um, so it's not ideal, and it's also very large uh, energy requirements. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we should look into whether prions are a problem or not. So. It's quite interesting because of the three presentations, we've got questions covering three very big spectrums. Um, and some of this is quite technical and some of it's much more business. It's like there's something for everyone in this. It's great. Um, Simon from Uganda is asking, um, while farmers are willing to use the lava, have you or do you intend to do any consumer studies on perceptions of their willingness to use the larvae on chicken? And I guess for you, Nick, as well in South Africa, because you still haven't established your market yet, the same thing. Are you going to be doing some uh, consumer studies as to where this could go? Yeah, no, definitely. We, we, we really need to understand the market better. Um, as I say, the operator wants to change their focus this year and rather produce uh, fertilizer products um, as opposed to feed, but there's definitely a commitment from them and we'll be supporting them in, in looking at the market and really, and, I mean, I think they're doing quite a lot of work on it internationally as well um, and they could probably contribute to that, but yeah, we definitely got to understand the, the market. Okay, and uh, Steve just put in that once they have real customers, uh, they will have a better idea as to customer perceptions, which is also probably very true. Um, yeah, with also, with also the idea of putting the price up, because at the moment we're benchmarking it against fish, and I think we, the better york quality and the, and the, 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 the uh, better egg production might justify uh, higher charges for black soldier fly larvae, making it a higher value product rather than trying to sell it as a, a competitive product. That's quite an interesting approach. Um, Okay, and then one question to kind of finish up on, because I think it's a really good question. Uh, what are the critical sustainability factors to be considered in scaling up um, black soldier fly waste processing? Um, which I think each of you have a different perspective on because of what your scale is. So maybe if we can just get a couple of points off each of you, uh, just to wrap up, I think that could be quite useful. So shall we start with Cecilia? So sustainability factors, as in environmental sustainability or social sustainability, uh, they're a bit uh, different, I suppose. But if I talk, um, I think that from an environmental sustainability point of view, it's, um, we, we know if we, if we do the treatment in a, what we've learned a pretty good way, then we don't have lots, uh, a lot of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions but we still have um, a lot of ammonia evaporation. And this comes out pretty negatively in a life cycle assessment. So we will have to capture the alcohol water and capture that nitrogen for it to have a good, uh, um, for it not to come out negatively. I mean, to not contribute to acidification. And, so. <laughs> and also, um, from, a sustainability, from a social sustainability point of view, I think that um, also, the, the best way of like getting uh, people to want to use the system is to show that it works, to have pilots to, to just show what it's all about. I think that's uh, a good way forward. And yeah. So. Yeah, I think that's really practical and useful. Um, Nick? 
Yeah, I, I would, you know, I, I would agree with Cecilia. You know, we the operator wants to go at a bigger scale, and we're saying that no, we've got to get it right. We've got to get it working um, effectively and be viable from a business point of view um, at the scale we've got it at now. I mean, it seems like it's at a bigger scale, but it's still it could be a lot bigger. So we, we've got to get it working at that scale first before we, um, yeah, sure. scale up first. Um, okay, and Steve. Uh, I, th I think the is an issue of uh, skill sets and getting people to understand them as a as a a, 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 a piece of life another li livestock um, but then also growing the business the, the killer is normally transport costs if you're having to transport lots of market waste large distances that transport cost can soon eat into your uh, viability mm. okay. Yeah, um, if, if, if I could add to that, um, also just to say, you know, you're needing the right, as a, as a sanitation solution, you need the right partner. So in our case, the municipality has been committed to this. Um, we've got an operator that's committed, and um, to take, you know, take it to the next level, they, everyone needs to be committed. We need, we need land, we need space, we need waste to come in. So you're needing different players to be committed, um, and, and the right people with the right, as Steve said, the right skills. You know, we could have an operator, but they might be struggling with certain skills to be able to really do it. I mean, those are things we've picked up as we've gone along that there are skill sets that are missing. Um, and we kind of think we've got just the right team, but we, we, we're missing certain things. So yeah, skill sets is, is critical. Sure. And I think the interesting thing, and it would be interesting to have this webinar in a year's time and just see where each project is because we originally talked about having this webinar about six months ago and realized that everyone was on the cusp of just actual production, which would make it more useful. So I think in another year, it would be really interesting to see the lessons that have been learned and what direction the scale has taken and adapting the technologies and the resources. So I definitely think that when it comes to black soldier fly, lava for sludge or waste, it's, you know, we're still learning and we're still progressing. So it's really interesting to see where you guys have got. And I know there are other projects going on in different places. And maybe we look at a review in a year's time and see the lessons that have been learned again. Um, for now, I'm going to say thank you to everyone. The presentations will be put up on the Susanna Forum thread, uh, as will the recording when it's ready. And um, feel free to pose any more questions in the thread the um, presenters will be available to answer them. And uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Great. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye, all.